Good afternoon, or good early evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. <coughs> I'm Ulrika Sheda, I'm the Executive Director of the Center on Global Transformation. And in that capacity today, uh, um, start us off with a few short remarks, um, uh, first on CGT and then on today's program. Uh, the Center on Global Transformation was founded 10 years ago uh, with the help of uh, generous support from Joan and Urban Jacobs at the Jacobs Foundation. And uh, this support allows us to bring in 10, 8 to 10 uh, global leaders from around the Pacific Rim. Uh, they're called PLFs, Pacific Leadership Fellows, and they're in residence for 14 days or so and uh, offer us an opportunity to connect to uh, thought leaders uh, around the Pacific. Um, today's uh, event with uh, Professor Thomas is the last of uh, uh, the academic year's event, and so it's a little bit special. Uh, I'd like to start out with, uh, uh, if you indulge me, with a special round of thanks uh, at the end of the school year to our staff. Um, and they've just been terrific, and without them we couldn't do it. Eva, Lisa, and, um, and the always up being Greg, uh, who are terrific in uh, helping and enhancing me to run this program. So thank you. Uh, today's program. Uh, again, because it's the last of the year, uh, we're doing something a little bit special tonight. Uh, we'll study. Since we're a university, uh, we'll study for about 50 minutes, about 5 0, that is. Then uh, we have a wine bar outside and, uh, and uh, some refreshments. And uh, while we're enjoying the wine, we also have the great opportunity to enjoy music by the group Sonic Impact. And Sonic Impact is special because it was founded by our very own MAS student, Robert Keith, who's standing over there. He's about to graduate. Robert built the Navy in Yokosuka, and he founded this ensemble, a large ensemble, and a subgroup of uh, the musicians are here with us tonight, and they will play some live music from around the world while we're enjoying the wine. Okay, with that outlook, uh, now let me introduce uh, today's uh, speakers, and I'll uh, uh, we'll have a conversation between uh, David Victor and our current PLF, so allow me to start with David. Our very own, uh, David Victor is a professor of international relations. He's also the co-director of the Laboratory on International Law and Regulation. And he is uh, uh, widely considered one of the most influential um, and insightful thought leaders and, and policy influencers in the fields of energy and environment. And we're very happy to have David uh, with us uh, this afternoon. And he will converse uh, with uh, Mauricio Tomas Grimm, who is a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he's also the former president and CEO of uh, Empresa de Pesquisa Energetica. Sorry about Portuguese, not, not so great. Um, and that uh, institution is part of Brazil's Ministry of Mines and Energy. Um, and uh, that actually is where he spent uh, an early portion of, uh, of his career, where he was in charge of uh, um, energy planning for Brazil. Uh, and uh, uh, Mauricio received a PhD in social economic development um, uh, in Paris, France, and has also more than 20 books on this topic. Uh, gentlemen, uh, if I could ask you to the stage, and thank you, Mauricio, for joining us for this for these two weeks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrike, for that introduction. Thanks to all of you for spending um, part of Wednesday evening with us. We're going to have a conference. We're going to have a fireside chat. The fire's right there, the crackling flames. We're going to have a fireside chat about the situation in Brazil and Brazil's energy policy. And then I'm going to open it up for, for questions along the way. Um, please, if you haven't done so already, silence your mobile fax machines and phones and any other paraphernalia you may have. Um, and uh, um, just as a reminder, the, the meeting tonight is on the record. So uh, there's a video that's being made that'll be posted online, and so you should treat this as on the record, along with the hundreds of millions of other people around the world who are going to watch us once we post this on, uh, uh, online. 
Um, maybe the place to begin is to talk a little bit about the situation right now. Just to add to Ulrike's biography of our speaker tonight, uh, Mauricio went into government in 2003 from a university professorship job and planned to stay there for a couple years. And 13 years later, he finally left government. Um, after And during that period, he was really the architect behind what is now widely seen as one of the most successful electricity markets and, mar and auctions in the world. And so we can actually learn a lot from what Brazil has done, and we'll get to that later, uh, later tonight. But along the way, a lot of other things have changed in Brazil. Uh, Brazil today is a $4 trillion economy. It's twice the size of the next largest economy in Latin America, enormously important country, and yet obviously a lot of troubles. You've been through one president in the last year. You may be about to go through a second president. I'm wondering maybe to, before we talk about energy and Brazil's role in the world energy markets, tell us a little bit about what's going on and what your impressions are of the mood and the confidence in the government and what that uh, means for investment in the economy. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank the kind invitation to be here. It's a wonderful time now, now uh, for me. Well, uh, you're right. Brazil is passing by a terrible moment. We have an economic crisis and a political crisis. Uh, in the economic side, uh, in 2015, the economy has a f a fall 3.8%. Last year, the economy has fall 3.6%. And barely the economy will grow, let's say, half percent this year. The uh, 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 2015, the rate of unemployment was 5%. Nowadays, the rate of unemployment is 14%. So in two years and a half, the rate of unemployment grew from uh, 5 to 14%. Uh, what, what's the, uh, what's, what's the reason of this, this pro economic problem? You have external reasons and internal reasons. The external reasons, well, Brazil is a very, account export a lot of commodities. About 65% of our exports are commodities. 50% uh, of our exports go to China. Well, the first decade of 20s, with the super cycle of the commodity, was a very good period in Brazil. And during this period, Lula was the president, and he has rescued 36 million people from the poverty, the poverty to the middle class thanks to this, this uh, the super cycle of commodity. Jim arrived in 2011, in the end of the super cycle of commodity. The price of the iron fell down, the oil price fell down, everything fell down. So uh, this, let's say, external resource was no more there. In the internal arena, we had uh, problems too, because uh, the 2008 crisis, well, Lula uh, chose to, let's say, make a kind of uh, control cycle policy. Give a lot of financing to the industrials, reduce taxes, increase credit to the consumption. And uh, well, what, he was very successful. In 2010, Brazil was growing, has grew 7.5%. So big success. But then Dilma arrived, and then she continued with this policy. And then this was, I think, a mistake, because uh, this has increased the debt and has caused inflation. So then you start, uh, let's say, uh, a problem. In the political side, uh, well, we have, uh, we, well, the, we are passing for the worst uh, case of uh, corruption and, uh, in our history. Uh, the federal police has discovered uh, corruption in Petrobras, this corruption is linked to the political system, and then this well, uh, put a big problem in the political arena. At the same time, uh, Dilma was impeached because she broke the budget law. So, in fact, this is not the real 
reason, this was the reason that was adopted. But because, uh, well, let's say, Fernando Cardoso and Lula has broke the budget a lot too, and was not impeached because of that. The, the, let's say the real reason is that, let's say, first of all, she was very unpopular. Because of the economic crisis, the population went to the street to manifest and against her. She was very unpopular. And second, well, uh, uh, the Congress itself was very upset with her because they are very afraid of the investigation of the police, federal police, for the uh, public persecutors. And the kids, they, they think that she was doing nothing to impeach there. So then uh, the Speaker of the House lead the process of, 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 uh, of uh, impeachment. It was noted that she was not accused of corruption. The, only, the problem or the accusation was broke of the budget law. Now, now the speaker that has led the, the impeachment process is in jail because accused of corruption. And let the, the, the Supreme Court has, uh, uh, has uh, uh, authorized the investigation of 39 deputies, 24 senators that uh, correspond to one third of the total number of senators, including the current, current speaker of the House and the, the current speaker of the Senate, uh, three governors and eight ministers that are from the government now. So, and to complete that, two weeks ago, the vice president that, that became president was caught by an in industrial, in reported by an industrial, talking about uh, uh, corruption. And then probably, so there is a big risk that this president will be, let's say, have to step out too. So, uh, we have, uh, is a turmoil now in Brazil, and uh, well, that's the situation. So I, I guess my question, I guess my, Russians are listening in, I didn't grab the game. <laughs> I guess my question is, inside Brazil, are people looking at all of this, you know, a third of the Senate under some form of an investigation, the president potentially about to lose his job, is that all evidence that the problems are being worked out and rule of law is being established? Or is this all evidence that we're in for potentially years more of political turmoil and then presumably turmoil for investors and turmoil for the economy? Well, I, I, uh, uh, well, I don't know about what is happening. Uh, one important thing is the institutions are working. The, judici the judiciary are working. The, the investigation are freely are working. The public persecutor are independent. The po federal police are independent. So this, let's say, is me, me, let's say the good side. The, the good, but we, we don't know. In terms of investment, it affects investment. The, the, the investment for uh, uh, the last two years from seven, the foreign investment fall from $73 billion to $50 billion. But anyway, Brazil was the sixth uh, economy in the world that has received more uh, foreign investment even uh, after that. Right. So I think the, the, the big question is why, with this bad situation, why the foreign investors are still investing there? The six countries receive more foreign investment. I think there are many answers for that. First, of all, that the investors they don't look the short term; they look the long term. Well, Brazil has 200 million people of population. Most of them are young people. Brazil, uh, let's say, the institutions, as I said, is working well. The judiciary is working well. The 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 contracts are being respect. So. Uh, has a lot of natural resource. And let's say even the crisis is, is an 
makes uh, 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 some investors came to Brazil is, is because, let's say, the interest, uh, the rate of return of the investment is very high. Because as you have to attract foreign investors, the project, you can have very big profit if you invest there. So uh, this attracts the foreign investors too. And so uh, 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 the situation now is that, uh, let's say, uh, we continue to, 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 to have the foreign investor. And uh, in the power sector included, uh, the Chinese companies are invest a lot in the, the power sector. Uh, uh, three, uh, three gorge corp uh, and uh, uh, state grid, two Chinese, big mm -hmm. Chinese company. Yeah. They are bought in everything in Brazil. Three gorge became the biggest private company in the power sector, Brazilian power sector. Uh, and uh, uh, Trigoz has bought the assets of Duke Energy, the American yeah. Duke Energy. And Trigoz have bought uh, the assets of, uh, of uh, one of the constructors that are being investigated, that is CPFL, that's a big distributor that distributes uh, energy for more than 500 municipalities in Brazil, the more wealthy municipalities. And both has invested last year something as $12 billion. And there are other, not only the Chinese, the Chinese are, are the main one, but let's say you have uh, the Italian NL, uh, you have uh, the Colombia ISA, you have the French, uh, uh, what? The F, no, but there is the other one, Engie, Engie. and uh, well, uh, many companies are uh, 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 invested. So let's say the crisis is not, let, let, has affected the investment, but still that not, let's say, uh, the, the investors are still going to Brazil. Yeah, that's interesting. So one more question about the general picture, then I want to turn to energy. Um, Fifteen years ago, when you were going into government, the Brazilian energy system the Brazilian economy was on the cusp of a tremendous takeoff, maybe fueled by policy, certainly fueled to some degree by the super cycle and commodity prices. And Argentina to the south was a disaster. Political troubles, investors fleeing left and right, Duke Energy, EDF, others that you mentioned, NL, um, taking Argentina to international arbitration over violation of contracts, kind of one problem after another. Today, it seems like some of the situation is reversed, although I think the picture in Brazil is much stronger than we read about in the newspapers for all the reasons you talked about. Are, are the Brazilian policy elite and business elite worried about the country's standing vis-a-vis um, -vis other places to invest, like Argentina, or is there kind of confidence that the system is working and that everything's going to come back to order? No, no, everybody's worried that the situation is a very bad situation. Nobody liked that. Uh, what, uh, no, no, uh, what I'm saying is that, let's say, despite all this situation, let's say. It's not as bad as it could be. Yes, no, it's very bad, but let's say, in the, what concerns <laughs> the, the foreign investment, they still are there yeah. because they think there are big opportunities. Yeah. But let's say, uh, the situation is very bad. Not, we, we have some familiarity in this country with things not being as bad as they absolutely could be, so I, a, <laughs> I appreciate that. Let me, let me, let's turn and talk a little bit about energy. One of the themes tonight is about Brazil's role as an energy superpower. It's really just the, the natural resources of the country are extraordinary, both on the hydroelectric side and uh, electricity and on the oil and gas side. So we want to talk first about oil and gas. And then we can talk about electricity, which is really an area where you've been at the center of, of the policy for so many years. Sure. So on the oil and gas side, help us understand the situation um, for continued production. Let me just try and set the scene for people who are not following Brazil very closely. Petrobras, the, the state not owned but partially owned uh, uh, oil company, um, over the last 10, 15 years became one of the, the most admired state-connected oil companies in the world, right up there uh, next to the Norwegian state-owned oil company. And yet now it's in the middle of this current political scandal. Um, is that going to, to undermine the ability of Brazil to continue to look for and produce new oil and gas resources? Help us understand what that situation uh, is right now. 
Yes, you are completely right. Petrobras is in the middle of what I can call the perfect storm. Because let's say uh, Petrobras has a very huge debt, $126 billion is the big debt of, from, between all the oil companies. There is a big investigation of corruption and is facing the, 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 the fall in the oil price. So the scenario is not good. But let's say I'm very confident in, in the oil sector. Why? Because the pre-salt is a very interesting area. The pre -salt, this is the large oil deposit just offshore uh, Sao yes, Paulo. Yes, the pre-salt is an uh, uh, offshore area very far from the coast. You, you found oil at uh, more than 5,000 meters. It's, it's, you need very high tech to do it, but uh, well, Petrobras can develop that. And in, in the pre-salt uh, uh, area, you have, let's say, uh, at, at least 40 billion, do, uh, 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 40 billion barrels of oil at between 20 and 50 dollars. So it's, uh, uh, let's say, if uh, this is real, Brazil would became the, uh, it became the tenth economy in terms of reserve oil in the world. So it's uh, something uh, very important. It's a, and, uh, it's a light oil. So it's a oil very that valuable, has yeah. a lot of value in the international market. Well, only to give an idea, uh, 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 the, the production of the pre-salt is increasing very, very fast. In 2010, the production in pre-salt area was 41,000 barrels. Now, six years later, the production is 1 million barrels. And the productivity is very high. One well in the pre-salt area produce 150 times more than one area, than one well outside the pre-salt area. So very high productivity. So uh, let's say uh, all these factors make, let's say, the pre-salt area very attractive. One of the most attractive areas for investment, uh, I think, in the world. So I think that, let's say, now what Petrobras is doing is, let's say, she uh, uh, is trying to uh, reduce uh, uh, the indebtedness uh, and then focusing in the upstream and disinvesting the other sectors. Because the, so Petrobras is se selling, let's say, uh, assets in the biofuels, assets, assets linked to pipelines, uh, uh, thermal power plants, uh, petrochemical. Uh, regasification station, you sell a lot of assets in order to reduce the indebtedness, and 8% uh, of the investments for the next, last, uh, next four years are for, uh, to the upstream. So it's focused on the upstream. So I think this is necessary to, to, to let's say, to, to face this, this indebtedness problem. Do you think Petrobras can implement this strategy with the current leadership, or does there need to be additional reforms to basically separate Petrobras from the government? Because that's been part of the political controversy is yes. that the relationship between the two, especially to Dilma Rousseff, was so close that it was almost inevitable there would be substantial corruption. Yeah, there was a problem, and the main problem I think that was, uh, let's say, the political parties indicates the directors of Petrobras, and then this, there was you know, this was, I think... Uh, that but that problem, the, the problem of a lack of a truly independent board of directors persists today. How does that no, problem I, get I fixed? I think that the, 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 the directly now is pretty independent. But, uh, and, well, Petrobras has made some movements. First of all, uh, uh, has created uh, uh, directly that uh, a compliance directly and have introduced some measures to combat uh, uh, corruption inside the, the company. But, uh, well, I, I believe that uh, you can have a, a public company without corruption if you have introduced the, 
the, the measures to avoid corruption. I think that's, that's possible. You mentioned that um, by some measures, Brazil would be the 10th largest, maybe even larger. Yes, if, if the, with, with this tremendous reserves in the pre-salt, and there may be more out there as well. Everywhere else in the oil industry, because the price of oil has come down in the last two years, everywhere else in the oil industry, there's been this tremendous effort to cut costs. In the Gulf of Mexico, for example, the cost, all-in cost of running uh, an oil rig has come down by 25, 30 percent. It's just an unbelievable transformation in the whole industry. Globally, the industry has become much more competitive. I'm sensing from you that you think Brazil can keep up and compete in that environment. Well, Brazil, as all the other countries, was affected by the fall in the price. This is, this, this is true. Uh, I think that Brazil make a very big, Petrobras make a, make a very big effort to be more, uh, more productive. Uh, and Petrobras, been, uh, as I said, the pre-salt area is very interesting because you uh, can produce, uh, the output per oil well is 150 times bigger than outside the, the pre-salt area. So they have natural conditions that, uh, let's say, make, I think, the, the pre-salt area competitive even uh, if the price uh, fall down. Okay. Uh, it's so true that we ha have a high cost to explore there because you uh, have to to go very. You know the helicopter. There's, there's no autonomy to arrive in the platform. No, it's, it's so one, far. It's a one-way road. <laughs> they have to, to to. Yes, no. They have to stop if you in the middle and then follow to the to the, the platform. So it's yes, yeah, very challenging, but I think it's possible. Yeah. Let me um, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the electric power industry. Um, I think possibly your greatest accomplishment in government was to design a new system of auctions, a new s design for the electric power system in Brazil. Um, before we talk about what's happening inside Brazil, help us, an audience of mainly Americans, help us understand what are the things we should learn the most by looking at your experience with reforming the electric power system in, in Brazil. I think the situation is different between Europe and Brazil, and maybe United States and Brazil too. Let's say, uh, uh, I think that the main concern here and in Europe is to make the power, let's say, to make the power sector more e efficient as possible. This is our concern too. But I think that the more important concern in Brazil is to increase the power capacity. Because, let's say, the demand grows on average 5% per year. So, you, uh, uh, in 2001, we have a very, uh, we, uh, we try to, start, uh, to, uh, to introduce in Brazil the, the, the bridge model, you know, a very competitive model, the model that Thatcher has, has introduced in Britain. Now they change, but uh, let's say, uh, a very competitive model. And this, was a failure because, uh, let's say, the investor find, find that it was too risky to invest there, and then we have to cut 20% of electricity in all, all the, their house. Then when I arrived to the government, we said, well, our main concern is to attract private investors to invest in the sector. This is our concern. So to attract investors, we have to, to give long-term PPAs. With the long-term PPAs, they could go to the bank, uh, mm -hmm. uh, use the, the long-term PPA as part of the collateral and make project and just A PPA is a contract to sell electricity over a long time horizon, so it's quite attractive for investors because it's, yes. it's a stream of payments that you yes. can use to finance 20 the years PPA, uh, long-term long contracts, 30 years for, for hydro. And then the National Development Bank accepted this, this, this contract as collateral to give the to finance the project. So, uh, you know, we have attracted a lot of our investors with that. And where was the competition? There was, the competition was for the right to side contract. So I used to say, we ha instead of have competition in the market, I mean the competition market, you build a plant, and then after you build a plant, you look, find, try to find a, a buyer to your energy. So is what's very risky, mainly in a hydro country, because a hydro country, let's say I'm going to build a power plant, thermal power plants, and then you have 
four wet years. So the spot market is very low, the price. And then I have built the, the, the power plant. I cannot sell my electricity because uh, nobody needs my electricity. So it's very risky. So we said, instead of have a, a, a competition in the market, let's force a competition for the market. So all the agents are going to compete in an auction process to the right to so sign a long-term PPA. So, we, and this competition is ve very big competition. Uh, 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 in the, uh, sol the last solar auction in 2015, 600 projects totaling 20 gigawatts, 20,000 megawatts. And to give you an idea, Itaipu, that's the biggest, uh, the second biggest hydropower plant in the world has 14 gigawatts. So we're talking about 20 gigawatts of it's twice solar. the size of the solar installed in California. Uh, applied to participate of the auction. So, and th th this auction was so competitive that it took eight hours of duration of uh, and 100 rounds of the Christian price. So, you know, this is something that's working. When we started this in Brazil, uh, mainly with, uh, well, uh, we started this in 2005. Nobody was uh, doing that. And then uh, after, uh, a little after that, we started with the renewables. When we started that, we were the first culture to, to introduce that. Then I remember that uh, uh, Bloomberg has called and said, oh, but, but the people are going to bid, but they're not going to build that, that, that plant because the price has fallen down a lot. The price fall to one third of the price that we had with the feed-in tariff. So feed-in tariff is a, a tariff that the, the government incentivized tariff that the government made. So at that moment, Germany, all the European countries use feed-in tariff. And then we start with that. And then I remember that uh, Bloomberg invited me to a debate here in New York which uh, are German guys, uh, they put me this stage. The German guy was there, he was here, and then the, the investors should vote. And then they, they, they were sustaining the Fidim tariff, the Fidim tariff program, and I sustained the auctions. And then the mediator said, oh, I think they are going to lose this auction because here we have all investors. All the investors want higher price. They want a higher rate of return. Nobody want lower price, and we, your system, your price will reduce. I, see, I don't think so, because the winner of the auction receive a long-term BPA, receive financing, and then we can attract 300 to 400 investors because they think that's safe, even if the price is lower. So the price is lower because the risk is lower. So, uh, 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 and now even Germany is doing auctions. I, I'm coming from Asia now because the World Bank asked me to go there I was in Singapore uh, just before here, talking to the Asian countries because they want to introduce auctions there. So I think that's, that's interesting. Is, is this is the big lesson that the world has now learned from the resilient experience, which is that auctions help drive down the price, but then they need to be backed by a long-term contract. Yes. In order to. So the, this thing of long-term contract, I know that this, let's say, for uh, some specialists, is something that the, the, they don't like, they prefer, let's say, a kind of competition uh, each day in the market, something like that. It, I think that's very, it's, it's okay, but if you need to attract investors, the long-term contracts are better. Well, in fact, across the Western economies, including in California, we've done the opposite. We've gone to shorter term spot arrangements and, and, and so on. So there's a kind of theme that emerges from your career here around using markets and auctions with long-term contracts to attract renewables. Later in your career, you ran the planning agency for the energy sector in Brazil. Do you think, when you look around the world, because you travel a lot, when you look around the world, do you think that most governments have kind of lost their capacity to do long-term planning, which is necessary? Yes, I think the, this is something that's very necessary. One of the mistakes that uh, uh, the government before we arrive has made they thought that, let's say, the market would solve everything. The market is very, very important. I believe in the market. But the infrastructure sector, we need some kind of 
light, guidelines, some kind of planning, not a kind of planning that, let's say, Russia they, they used to do in the, the old time. They're talking about, let's say, policies. Policies to, to say, well, we are going to contract certain amount of energy. And this, let's say, for the renewables, very important. Because, let's say, we have attracted the wind industry to Brazil. Nowadays, we have, uh, uh, let's say, I, I think six or seven international industries producing manufacturing in Brazil. Uh, wind plants, but uh, say, well, we are going to contract certain amount of uh, wind plants each year. So this was helpful then to convince the, 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 uh, the board that they, should, they could build a plant because they are going to have a market. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, let's say, the, the, the government has the role to give some, high, uh, some signs and then let the, the, the investor, the private market compete. The uh, competition is, is very important. Yeah. I want to ask you a question or two about climate change, and um, then we'll open it up. So all of you should start thinking about your own brief questions you want to ask. Uh, and then uh, let me ask you, Mauricio. Um, during your time in government, Brazil put together its first pledge of the actions it would take to control emissions. It participated in the Paris Climate Conference, although the scandals around Dilma Rousseff were just beginning then, so that diminished perhaps her participation there. Tell us, um, what should we expect from Brazil in terms of its participation in the climate change problem? And then I want to talk with you a little bit about the role of America, but let's focus on Brazil first. Well, Brazil has made a very bold uh, pledge because we have committed to reduce in 37% uh, the greenhouse emissions below the 2005 level in 2025, and 43% below the 2005 level in, for, in 2030. So this uh, is one of the, the more important commitment. And Brazil could do this mainly because of uh, the reduction in deforestation. Because uh, contrary of the rest of the world, let's say, in the rest of the world, 8% of uh, uh, the energy sector is responsible for 8% of the greenhouse gas emission. In Brazil, the energy sector is uh, responsible for only 25% of the greenhouse emission. The main response of, of, to, to the greenhouse emission is the deforestation. Uh, uh, and Brazil has reduced since uh, uh, 2005 75% of the deforestation. Uh, and this reduction in the def deforestation allow a reduction of 40% in greenhouse gas emission. So it's thanks to this reduction that Brazil could, let's say, commit mm -hmm. such a bold uh, goal. Uh, but anyway, let's say we are, the Brazil we are going as a country that the, we expect they are going to grow, so we are going to need more energy. And as we are going to need more energy, the, the trend is to, to emit more. So the big challenge continues to be a very renewable country. Brazil has a very renewable mix, energy mix. About uh, between, about 41% of our mi energy mix renewable, while in the world only 30% renewable, and the OCD countries only 7% renewable. And if you look at the power sector, uh, the difference between Brazil and the rest of the world is even bigger. Between 75 and 85 percent of the power generation in Brazil is renewable, depending if it's a wet year or a dry year. While in the world, only 20 percent is renewable, and 40 percent of the old generation is coal. So let's say our challenge was, let's say, how, uh, uh, let's say, man, uh, maintain a high share of renewable. So, the main, uh, well, how we, uh, we are planning to do that? Well, uh, uh, we are going to decrease, reduce the share of hydro. The, the hydro will continue to grow in absolute terms. I'm going to reduce the share of hydro because it's more and more difficult to obtain environmental license. Uh, there are a lot of issues concerning the, the construction of hydro. And increase the, 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 the share of non-conventional. So the non-conventional renewables, uh, I mean, solar, uh, wind, uh, biomass, and so on, 
nowadays uh, represents 90% of the power generation. In the world, the average is 6%. So our goal is to pass from 9% to 23% in 2030. And there, here, I, I, there, there is a very interesting uh, thing. Uh, when Dilma came to states to uh, have a meeting with Obama, I was in the, uh, uh, together to her and, and came in the mission. And then Obama and uh, Dilma has make a common state that both countries, United States and Brazil, would achieve 20% of non-conventional renewables until 2030. And uh, so I think uh, 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 this was very important. I think that uh, I, I'm talking, maybe this is something that um, we are going to talk later, but uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say uh, the participation of the United States in the process was interesting because yeah. let's say both presidents make a common state about uh, their goal to the future. One quick question on that, and then I'll open up the audience. Uh, now, a lot of news reports today, obviously, about potential withdrawal from the Paris Agreement by the United States. The Trump administration is a high-frequency noise generator, so we don't know exactly what they're going to do when. But if the United States withdraws from Paris, does Brazil do less? which is what's implied in your comment about the joint statement with Obama, or does Brazil just kind of keep doing what it's doing? Yes, I, well, it's a good question. I think Brazil will maybe you continue, but let's say it would be more difficult. I, uh, let's say, I was very criticized uh, because, well, by the industry saying, well, why Brazil is adopting that? Brazil is already a very renewable country. Why Brazil has make it such a commitment. And now I think the, the critics has, let's say, they're going to say, well, you are seeing Brazil has made this pledge, and now is there, and then United States that have made the, the pledge together, and now is leaving. Uh, and uh, let's say, uh, each, uh, uh, I want to give an idea, each Brazilian, in terms of the energy sector, not talk about the emit the correspondent to, to uh, uh, emit twenty percent of the emission of each American. So each Brazilian, when consume energy, emit twenty percent of what an American emit. So this is a strong number to the critics to say, well, what government is that? that go and make a, such a pledge now when you have such a difference, different situation between both countries. So, uh, but I think that the most of the country are going to continue. I think China will going to continue with yeah. that. India will go to continue. The Europe are going to continue. Uh, uh, I think Brazil will continue too. I think, that, I think, I, I think there are some countries that was not that uh, some small countries that make are going to use that to not uh, fulfill the commitment. I think that maybe the, the worst situation can be for the United States itself, because I think there is one thing that's very important in foreign affairs, that is the credibility. Yeah. I think that's the, the, main, the main point that uh, yeah. can affect. Point well taken. Comments, questions, please? Why don't you tell us who you are and then just ask your question. Do we have a microphone? We do. It's on its way. Uh, hi, my name is Jeffrey, uh, UC San Diego Department of Mathematics. Venezuela is in a serious uh, crisis, uh, economically, politically, and there's tremendous social unrest, and I'm wondering how that's impacting uh, Brazil in the various ways that you've talked about economically, energy-wise, and other. Thank you. Well, when things look bad, you've always got Venezuela. <laughs> well, uh, uh, in fact, well, Brazil exports a lot of goods to Venezuela. Brazil is a big exporter to Venezuela. So, uh, 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 <clears throat> let's say, Brazil is not 
at the moment affected because Venezuela continues to, to import goods from, from Brazil. So let's say for this point of view, there is, uh, 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 this is not affected. Brazil has, a, 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 there is a, in the north of Brazil, one hydropower plant, Guri, uh, that's in the Venezuela size, and Brazil used to import uh, uh, electricity from Venezuela. Now, let's say there was a problem, Venezuela was not exporting because there was a draw there, um, but well, this is not a big issue. So let's say, uh, uh, I think that uh, we are not uh, directly affected by the, 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 the Venezuelan problem, uh, let's say, for the, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. Sir? There's another microphone coming out over your shoulder right there. Thank you. Uh, Arthur Lipper, British Far East Holdings. In a country with 40% unemployment and no real way of changing that, how long do you believe the army will <coughs> remain loyal to the government? How, how long, sorry? How long do you believe the army will remain loyal to the government? Or more uh, precisely, the, okay, the military it's a, it's a, force. It's a good question. Well, uh, I hope that uh, we have changed this page in Brazil, because you know, Brazil has suffered a lot about the military period, because uh, we have a dictatorship, for the economic point of view, Brazil has grown, but for the social point of view, for the human social view, was very was terrible. Uh, the democratic point of view was terrible. So I hope that uh, uh, it's true. There is now a small part of the population that starts to talk about that. This scares me, but there is. It's a small part. I hope that's not, you know, when you have crisis, as you say, normally there are, let's say, now you have one candidate that, let's say, we never had, let's say, right side candidates in Brazil. Uh, normally in Latin America, everybody's left. I don't know why, but this is very common. So, but now we start to have real right and even extreme right. So maybe it's the effect of the crisis. But let's say they are a minority. It's still a minority. I don't believe that they are going to, to win and that the army are going to, let's say, take the power, something like that. I don't believe that. Sir? Right here. Hi, I'm uh, Julio Grillo. I'm a student at Miramar College. Um, and it seems like you presented a bit of uh, a conflict uh, in what you're talking between um, Brazil trying to go to cleaner energy and also discovering a very large deposit of um, oil and things like that off the coast. So how do you think that'll play out and how do you think those two will affect each other? Great question. Everybody talked about that when we discover oil uh, most of the environmental uh, uh, organization in Brazil say, no, uh, this is a mistake. You sh should not develop the oil because we are, we are a green country. And uh, I think that's, uh, let's say, uh, it's not possible. No, no country which when discovered such uh, riches, such, such oil, are going to say, no, I'm not going to exploit that. But uh, it's not, uh, 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 Brazil ha has a very important uh, uh, ethanol program. So I think that Brazil, the production of oil, some part go to the internal market, but as we have a lot of, let's say, uh, uh, renewable energy as ethanol uh, and others, uh, we are going to export the surplus, we are going to have a big, larger surplus, and we are going to export the surplus to other countries. So, is interesting because Brazil maybe will be the first oil export country to have the most renewable energy matrix. What, what seems crazy because you know, but is, why that? Because, but because the, the renewables came first of the oil. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, so now I, I are not going to, let's say, destroy everything because we have discovered oil. Because 
there are the, 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 the all, all the distillery uh, are there, are the industrials, are the sector. Nobody is going to say, oh, now I'm going to close everything because we have found oil. So Brazil, let's say I'm going to export oil and continue to have uh, renewable max. What seems, may seem a little bit paradoxical, but uh, it's what would happen. Is the same true for natural gas? When I first met Dilma Rousseff, 2004, 2005, she was in the middle of trying to force everybody to build natural gas pipelines. You had these big deposits in Bolivia. That was kind of yes, a disaster. Yes, well, it is, is, is the situation with natural gas investment as optimistic? The situation, well, Brazil doesn't have a lot of natural gas. Brazil, uh, the, the reserves of natural gas in Brazil correspond to 10% of the um, North American reserves. Anyway, the result has increased in 40% of our reserve but still is 10% of the North American reserves. Brazil imports 50% of the natural gas consumption. So 30% from uh, uh, Bolivia the, through the pipeline and the rest uh, uh, LNG. Uh, so uh, Brazil, so we are very dependent of natural gas uh, uh, and uh, with the, the, let's say, the, the, the pre-salt, maybe are going to reduce the dependence, but they still remain dependent. And uh, 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 the, now, in 2019, the, the agreement with Bolivia will, fin will arrive to an end. So Brazil has to renew that. And then Petrobras already said that they are not going to, to buy everything. So the Bolivians are looking for uh, other buyers. So there is a all. If we're efficient, we have time for a couple more questions, Ricardo. Do Ricardo and then Gordon. Ricardo Simões, I'm visiting scholar at the uh, GPS. Um, one of the crises that we need to, to deal with is a crisis of, uh, fiscal crisis. And uh, when our actual uh, uh, current constitution was released in 19, 1988, uh, our taxation it was around uh, 22, 23% of the, our GDP. And now <clears throat> our taxation is around 35% of our GDP and the government needs to, 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 to go to the, the financial market to, to finance a debt, uh, uh, state debts around 10%. So we have a, a Brazilian state uh, an oversized Brazilian state uh, that costs around 45% of, of, of our GDP. Uh, according to your experience in the long period in the government, uh, how to reset, how to, 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 to define new priorities of Brazilian state, while at the same time we have a strong position as entrepreneur in the oil gas sector, in the power sector, and at the same time, we have a lack of state in uh, clean water and sanitation, for example. Yes, uh, that's, uh, I think, the, the big question now in Brazil, because the big question now in Brazil is that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we have a budget, and uh, we don't have, uh, 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 and even with big taxes, we don't have resource enough to, 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 to meet the budget. I think this is, so I need the reforms. And uh, now is, uh, uh, I think everybody agreed that we need reforms. Uh, reforms uh, to reduce the, 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 the expenses. The, the big problem now is that this kind of reform, uh, I, in my point of view, must be made uh, you need some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, the, 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 who do the, the, the reforms ha has to have votes behind him, mm. has to have, let's say, I don't know the, the word, that has to have to-, to the Political to, support. Uh? You need to have political support for the reform. Yes, because the problem is when you do this structural reforms, you are taking advantage for some part of population uh, and others. So, these are big, true choice. And I, I don't think that uh, 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 legitimacy is the word that I, I, I miss. The president has to have legitimacy. 
That seems a long way off. And then this, I think that's, that's the problem, because now, uh, well, it's trying to, to do the reforms, but I think that lack legitimacy to, to do that. Well, the microphone goes to Gordon McCord for the last question. Do you think that the widespread agreement on the need for reforms includes reforms at the State Development Bank, the NDS? Yeah, uh, probably, yes. I think that, uh, I think that is, is, is all right. The, the problem in Brazil is that, say, we need to create a, 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 a private sector that finance investment. In Brazil, I don't know if it's the chicken egg problem. I don't know if it, because we have the National Development Bank, you don't have private financing, or because we don't have private financing, that National Development Bank has to be so big. But the problem is that this is one, is one problem because uh, uh, is a kind of, well, uh, the interest rate is very high. The, 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 the government take money, pay a, a high interest rate, and then the National Development Bank low money with a low interest rate. Right, right, right. So uh, how we solve that? Well, attractive private investment, private financing, but this is easy to say, but it's not <laughs> easy to do. And every chicken thinks they're actually the egg. Uh, Gordon McCord, last question. Hi, Gordon McCord, professor here at GPS. Uh, do you think that after the current political storm has passed uh, and it's time to think about the long term again and, and, um, and the climate change agenda specifically, do you think that Brazil will step into the role that the rest of Latin America in a way has been waiting for for a long time of the true regional leader vis-a-vis uh, -vis this agenda? Uh, have there been conversations internally about bilateral relationships for technolo uh, green technology transfer or financing for the poor Latin American countries with Brazil as a lead donor uh, using either multilateral vehicles at the Inter-American Development Bank or bilateral vehicles uh, with Brazil so that Brazil really steps into the leadership position uh, regionally? I think that Brazil can play this role. Uh, and I think that uh, for some time, uh, I think the United States back in that, Brazil take this kind of lead, say, oh, okay, uh, you have to take care of, uh, at least of your neighbors and, and help. Now we are not <laughs> a good situation to do that, <laughs> a very bad situation. And uh, sometimes, let's say, uh, the internal, popul the population and even the ministry, they don't uh, understand that. So let's say, Sometimes when Brazil make an agreement with Bolivia, with other, it doesn't matter, with any other country, to Argentina, when Argentina needed, Uruguay, let's say, to help with the energy, things like that. There was a lot of internal criticism say, oh, you are doing bad business. Why are you doing that? And then they don't understand that's not business. This is uh, international relations. But let's say the people don't understand. They say, well, why are we giving electricity, free electricity to Argentina? Well, because they are our neighbor, we want to help them. But uh, let's say, uh, sometimes not easy to, 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 uh, to do that. I think that the Brazilian population, and not only the population, even in the ministry, something, they don't understand well what's the role that Brazil has to play. And they have to learn that. Well, I would say Brazil is not alone in having a population that doesn't always understand the difference between business and true political leadership. And so, please, um, it has been our extraordinary uh, pleasure and honor to, to have Mauricio here for 10 days and to hear his insights tonight. And so please join me uh, in, in thanking him.